you know. No, no see, well, it didn't. Carl had the same question. I just read the, I didn't read the whole bill, but I found the part. It had an exemption. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a lot of people think mm -hmm. it includes U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. I just Oh, how is it, how is it turned? I just looked at the bill. I can turn the page. Oh, okay, well, all right, that's good. Did it pass the Senate already? Is it, is it, is it, is it passing the Senate? It's not. It's supposed to be a new man. Who's got the hat? Oh, who's got the hat? I do. No. He's playing on the right. Yeah. Real, and then real quick, how, how, what do you feel our, our brand new man is? Chances, I know he's <laughs> pretty awful uh, situation. Uh, well, I, I spent this. I spent this morning with Steve Downs, who's a he's a lawyer who he used to uh, he used to um, work for the government, uh, kind of regulating judges and lawyers, looking for those who are breaking the law. So he's a kind of an interesting lawyer, but he his opinion is that the military courts for a case like this can probably have a better process than the civilian courts, you know? So that's, I'm, I don't know, you know, I don't have a strong opinion about that. I'm just offering that that's something to look at and consider, you know, that Bradley Manning may do fare better in a military court. And his point was that if the political context is the military probably doesn't want to deal with Bradley Manning. It's a political agenda point that they don't really want to get into, but people in Congress and people you know, on Wall Street want to get into. And so there may be pushback within the military against that. So Steve thought he had some things working for him. I saw that his lawyer had like 155 witnesses he wanted to present in the the process is different than civilian court, right? So this is like this is an important part of the military process is presenting witnesses before the trial begins, I believe. But if someone's a lawyer, they might know better than I do. But he'll win if we stick with them. That's what I think. You know, or it will go. I, I would say maybe not win. He'll do better if we build a movement around him and protest. You know. And the FBI raided his support committee, you know, already, you know? For what? Well, because they want to. You know, it's, the government's acting more and more capriciously without, you know, following any kind of standards. So, somebody else? Where is the Occupy movement from here? The RC Hall. Is it like a, right in front. Like no, a right. mile from here? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Point nine. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I just had to, to measure it. I think you can for, stop by yeah. there. I would like to see it. Oh, good. Yeah. You know, I didn't come all this way not to see yeah. it. Yeah. How about some other questions or comments? Brother? Um, so what behaviors like of FBI agents who infiltrated? I guess just more about that. Um, was she divisive in the community, or what? What sort of behaviors uh, that 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 the no, they FBI find the weak they find the weak link and they uh, sink in on them, and then they're the lover, and then all of a sudden they're like reporting everything you know. I I think it's different. That's true, but I think there's many kind of scenarios and yeah. many different ways to approach it. A woman spoke last night from the Project Salam, from Project Salam, and in Albany, and she was saying that there's these kind of uh, like skit FBI scenarios where they literally create like a, a short, short play, an act of a play, and they'll try to set up usually some young Muslim guy or Arab guy, and, you know, try to get them to download videos and then communicate with them over the internet or agree to do things. It's similar to what uh, happened to the two young guys from Texas who ended up in prison after the RNC protest in St. Paul, where the FBI agent befriended them and then kept trying to rope them into 
you know, let's do, I'm going to speak very generally, let's do this together, and then, you know, it's a crime. And they said yes, and then they didn't do it, but they still ended up getting two-year sentences. And for a better world, is Yeah, the, we're going to be showing that. Tomorrow. What, is that the name of yeah, it? For, uh, those people, those people are wonderful who made that movie, and they actually invited us to come um, petition and table outside their events. One hundred forty-six. One hundred forty-six dollars. Right. <laughs> <Eight drops. laughs> Who's head? Who's head? Thanks, sister. Yeah. So, so, but with us, with us, it's quite different what the FBI did because it was a long-term thing. The woman from Project Salam made this very clear. She said, these other events, you know, these other setup jobs, because they are, you know, it's just to railroad someone, that they do it very short term and quick typically, you know, a few months. But with us, you know, first she shows up in town and gets involved at the most basic level, right? Which is what people would do. If you, if I moved here, you know, I would probably come here and see what's happening and what to try to get to know people and slowly become involved. And that's what she did, you know. Then she joined the anti-war committee after a few months of getting to know people and started attending meetings. You know, she didn't just come in and say, I want this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to be, you know. It was all planned and kind of natural looking, you know. And she became great friends with some of my comrades and, you know, activists I were closest with, you know. Um, we think she pretended to be gay, right? We don't know, but we now think that was part of her cover or her story or whatever, the lies that she told. And then, you know, she worked hard in the anti-war committee and then she began to be interested in the Freedom Road Socialist Organization and we recruited her. And we tend to be a little more careful and a little selective, if you want to say it that way. You know, there's people who we say, we don't think this is the right group for you, you know? Either you don't really, you know, believe what we believe or, you know, have the, your unity is not the same as what we usually have. And so it might be about ideas or it might be about, we expect people to work really hard and sacrifice for the movement, you know, we really do. And so, you know, it, it takes a person who's willing to do that. So, you know, we kind of challenge people when we recruit them, you know. And how, how do you go about asking people to get more involved? Um, well, we ask them. We say, well, we would like you to do this. Are you willing to do this? Uh, this is a six-month project, a campaign to stop FBI repression. Uh, will you... Will you be the one who organizes the bus to come to the NATO G8 protest in Chicago, brother? <laughs> and, you know, it's very straightforward, you know? And, um, you know, it kind of goes against the grain for some people, but we get used to doing it, you know? We want what we want. So, um, she did not act particularly divisive. She usually acts, acted kind of over-eager, if anything. And, um, but that's not an aha moment, you know? Over-eager is like, well, a lot of new people are really eager, you know? And we don't want to bum them out. We want to encourage that. We want positive people in our movement. But, you know, there were signs of things that people, like, felt uncomfortable with. And it's more about feelings, too. It's hard to describe, so. I don't have any great lessons, I'm sorry. At what point were you asking? Absolutely certain. The day of the raid, she disappeared. And when someone called her, she said, don't ever call me again. Wow. Yeah, so that was pretty certain. Her job was done. Her job was done. But I think she didn't do a good job either, because I don't think there was anything to find. And attempts, you know, I don't know if there were attempts to, to create things, but I imagine if we end up in court, she'll be lying left and right. You know. <laughs> Say that again? That's all that matters as far as their use of her. What does that mean? They have her uh, established as a member of the group, and therefore she gets credibility in court for saying anything that the FBI wants to say. They've done the same thing 
with countless other school Christians over the years whose role has been exactly that. They, they have nothing to take and bring to the FBI, but their role is simply to fabricate according to whatever it is that the FBI wants them to say. Leonard Peltier's case is a good example. Good example. Well, to the extent of that, then, how, you know, as far as this person that you know, does this person now go into some kind of like witness protect this protection? I mean, wouldn't you think that there could be some loose cannon out there that says, well, I'm going to get revenge on her for the damage she's done to this organization or anything like that? I mean, how, what happens to this person? Well, she's a federal agent. She has a lot of protection. She's safe. How do we avoid that? Does anyone have a view about well, that? I mean, I, I've had experiences with undercover agents um, twice. One was right across the street here with the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Their office was on uh, Connecticut Street. And um, she had infiltrated not only that organization, but, um, but also the Attica Brothers Defense Committee. And um, she actually came clean about it. Um, but there was a house in, in Buffalo, um, it was firebombed um, the next day, and uh, tragically someone died in, uh, in, the, in the adjacent house. Um, you know, there was never any, um, um, she, she was asked to tell all of the damage that she did, which she, which she um, apparently did. Um, and there, there was never any repercussions against her. I, I think she had, um, I think she was a troubled person, you know, a, after that. Um, and the other experience I had was um, in Kent, Ohio, you know, many years ago, um, where um, a state police agent um, was trying to give um, people um, an RPG rocket launcher and an AK-47, suggesting that both things, one, one could be used against an ROTC building, and the second could be used to kill, quote unquote, pigs with. And uh, this guy was um, a state um, trollman who worked for the university. Oh, gee, I happen to have a bazooka. <laughs> and uh, of course, the behavior was very suspicious. Uh, how, I mean, a lot of what you said about the break ins you know, resonated with me because I had things like that happen you know, to me. And um, now, back then we didn't have computers, so we just stole a little index card <laughs> and, 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 and copied down names that had been written on the wall near the phone and things like that. Um, but we were pretty sure that there had been an infiltration, and we were able to find out um, from um, civil service records in Columbus that this guy indeed was a police agent before we moved on. And oftentimes um, police agencies don't work very closely with one another. So in our case, the city police did not know that this guy was an undercover agent, and the state police had not told the city police. So we told the city police that we knew about a dangerous radical who had these illegal weapons, and they went and arrested him. And um, it was in the paper, and um, alcohol and tobacco uh, agents from the ATF came in from Youngstown, and it was in the New York Times, it was in the Cleveland um, Plain Dealer, and eventually it wound its way into the Nation magazine, and the guy was like thoroughly exposed and discredited. He eventually got his job, you know, he eventually became a you know, full-fledged uh, um, officer for the Kent State Police Force. I mean, he was suspended for a period of time. There was a huge hull blue on the campus. Um, but the bottom line is that we outed him, you know, before he was able to do any damage to, um, um, you know, to my friends. Um, so, I mean, I think each case probably is its own peculiarities. Uh, That's right. Um, but I think the main thing is to um, expose the people and discredit them and to get as much publicity as you can for it. We waited some months before we revealed that we knew she was an agent, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we wanted to unfold the campaign and we wanted to understand better what the government was up to. So we waited till January to expose it, even though we knew in September. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we knew before then that something wasn't right. right. You also have to be absolutely certain if you're, you're going to move on somebody, because otherwise, 
you're, you're kind of playing into their hands where you're falsely accusing someone. So we, we didn't move until we actually had the evidence. That's right. Probably just taking a slow as people, I guess. There's that, you know. And the other thing to do, if, if you don't mind me just um, speaking as well, uh, is, 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 is to be very careful in, in terms of how, how you operate. I, I can remember um, in 1976 organizing about 20 or 25 people here in Buffalo to go to uh, what was called the, uh, it's interesting that the name of your magazine is called, uh, or your newspaper, Fight Back, because there had been, there was a convention in Chicago called the Fight Back. <laughs> There's a cut. Right. And, um, <laughs> And you know, I said, you know, I'll bring some people, and you know, I gave them the names of about 20 people, but I just gave them their first names. And they said, well, we, um, we, we need the first and last names. And I said, well, I said, you know me, right? They said, yeah. I said, do you trust me? They said, yeah. I said, yeah, my last name, right? Yeah. Okay, that ought to be good enough, because I know all these people, and I, I can vouch for them. So,